when it came to, you know, law and order, at least on a rhetorical level, like Trump took the spiel to new heights. I am the law and order candidate. While both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders tried and at times fumbled to address the growing Black Lives Matter movement, which of course is a decentralized movement, it arose in protest of the police killings of uh, black people in this country. Trump didn't even pretend that it was a serious issue, that it was a real issue. Uh, In fact, Trump often mocked it. He did not take the issue seriously. Beyond the rhetoric, Trump put a proven racist, Jeff Sessions, in charge of the Justice Department as attorney general. Unfortunately, in recent years, law enforcement as a whole has too often been unfairly maligned and blamed for the crimes and unacceptable deeds of a few in their ranks. Amid this intense uh, public scrutiny and criticism, morale has gone down uh, while the murder of police officers killed in the line of duty has gone up. Stocks in private prisons skyrocketed in the aftermath of Trump's election. We recently learned that David Clark, the Milwaukee County Sheriff, uh, was going to be getting a top post at the Department of Homeland Security. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make something very clear. Blue lives matter in America. Sheriff Clark was a big hit at the Republican convention where he showed up looking like a military general. At least he wanted to appear as one with all of his little medallions on his police uniform. Uh, But back in Milwaukee County, and I'm from Milwaukee, Clark faces very serious questions about a string of suspicious deaths that have taken place in holding cells, jails that are under his control. But he's uh, apparently on his way to Washington. Now, when, when Trump and his administration talk about crime and imprisonment in the black community, they do it with no historical context. They feed what I would call a racist narrative in addressing some of these staggering statistics. More than 60% of people in prison today are people of color. Black men are nearly six times as likely to be incarcerated as white men, and Hispanic men are more than twice as likely. For black men in their 30s, one in every 10 is in prison or jail on any given day. The rate of imprisonment for African-American women is more than twice that of white women. Right now, the United States has more than 2 million people in prison. That's a 500% increase over the past 40 years. That's the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Joining me now is the organizer and educator, Miriam Kaba. She is the founder of Project Nia and a co-organizer of Survived and Punished. She's also one of the sharpest people I know on Twitter, where her handle is Prison Culture. Miriam, welcome to Intercepted. Thanks for having me. Now, you refer to yourself as an abolitionist. What do you mean by that? Abolition for me is a long-term project and also a practice around kind of creating the conditions that would allow for the dismantling of prisons, policing, and surveillance and the creation of new institutions that actually work to keep us safe and are not fundamentally oppressive. What you need to make those conditions happen, you have to be for addressing environmental issues, you have to be for uh, making sure people have a living wage economically. I think I know for me it's important to be anti-capitalist. All those things feed into creating the conditions that would lead to the end of the things I want to see and the bringing into being of the things I want to have. For people who don't have a loved one that's been to prison, haven't been to prison themselves, just sort of view prison as a place where people who commit crimes go, Right. set a kind of context for people of the the institution of imprisonment in the United States and, and what that looks like. Prison itself is a reform. I think that's something that most people don't think about, right? Prisons haven't always existed. They came into being, especially in the United States, because people were trying to react against capital punishment and corporal punishment, which were seen at the time by particularly Quakers as incredibly inhumane. So initially, the reform itself was not meant to be a brutalizing thing. But isolation itself is actually brutal. Over the years, prisons have been spaces where we've sent the people we don't like. 
or the people we want to manage and control socially. Early before the Civil War, most people who were locked up were not actually Black people because almost every Black person in the country was enslaved. Immediately after you know, emancipation, all of a sudden, the literally complexion of prisons change. And Black be- people become kind of hyper-targets of that system. And we create new laws, the Black codes and other things like that. Convict lease system comes into being as a way to continue to exploit the labor of the people who are now newly free. The reason to talk about that history is also to demystify for people how and why people ended up behind bars initially. That it wasn't really about real crime, but it was about a perception of Blacks as inherently criminal in order to continue to control Blacks who people thought after enslavement actually didn't have a right to be free. That Black people couldn't manage freedom. And that was the story that got told. Um, and so the prison became a site for continuing to control Blackness. And we have arrived in the late 1960s when there was a rise in a murder and in robberies, particularly. So kind of violent crimes are rising at the same time as the Black power movement is also expanding. And these two things are being brought together only our brother Martin Luther King exhausted a means of nonviolence with his life being taken by some racist. What is being done to us is what we hate, and what happened to Martin Luther King is what we hate. You darn right, we respect nonviolence. But to sit and watch ourselves be slaughtered like our brother, we must defend ourselves, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. The story that gets told is that, you know, it's mainly Nixon who comes in and puts in the kind of war on drugs, the beginning of the war on drugs. And he was like, the Republicans are to blame for how the carceral state got built more massively. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Between 1825 until like the late 1960s, the prison population is stable. It's pretty low. In the late 1960s, you've got all these scholars and activists talking about the end of prison. People are talking about the prison as being over. So you have to think about like how we went from like the end of prison to all of a sudden the largest jailer in the whole entire international sphere in the world becomes the United States. And that's because of a set of policies that come into play. Um, And those policies are bipartisan policies, but really take off with Johnson, where Johnson wants to fight the war on poverty, and he gives in on creating a war on crime arm of the war on poverty. And What do the Republicans do, which they always do so well? They want to defund the poverty angle and they want to keep the war on crime. What was the motivation in in your assessment of these politicians, both Democrats and Republicans? It was, quote unquote, the riots. It was the images of those young black people in Watts and a 1964 in Harlem and in all these places where there were, quote, urban disorder and urban unrest. And the face of that were black young people. Six days of rioting in a Negro section of Los Angeles left behind scenes reminiscent of war-torn cities. More than a hundred square blocks were decimated by fire and looters, and few buildings were left intact. Firemen were harassed by snipers and brick-throwing hoodlums as they attempted to control the fires, many of which were left to burn themselves out. This is why you can't talk about incarceration, criminalization in this country without understanding the history of blackness and black people in this country, the ways in which the politicians have used us basically as the fuel to make things happen that then bleed out to the rest of the population. So we're always the canaries in the coal mine. We go into Bill Clinton and what he does with the 1994 crime bill. When I sign this crime bill, we together are taking a big step toward bringing the laws of our land back into line with the values of our people and beginning to restore the line between right and wrong. 
which actually doesn't have that much of an impact in terms of spiking the numbers even higher. What he does is give people more of an ideological basis to continue to do what they've been doing. He was one of the most destructive presidents for Black people. And we're still trying to recover from his reign, both in terms of what he put into place around immigration and immigrant detention. A lot of people don't think about that as Black the people who are most incarcerated within immigrant detention are disproportionately black immigrants. Well, and of course, you had this massive atrocity that happened at Guantanamo right. with uh, Haitians that were uh, right. uh, fleeing violence that the United States uh, uh, sponsored right. in the form of overthrowing Jean-Bertrand Aristide. And then you had uh, – and I think a lot of people, particularly young people, don't know this history. Before, Guantanamo was the place where That's Bush right. stuck people extrajudicially That's right. in the so-called war on terror. Clinton piled up the bodies That's inside right. of Guantanamo of That's right. The first independent black republic in the Western Hemisphere, That's Haiti. Right. It came back to haunt Hillary Clinton in, in Miami with the Haitians that were there not voting for her, right? So there's people have long memories. But welfare reform or what we call welfare deform um, had such a disproportionate impact, particularly on single black mothers. The ways in which the carceral state was kind of reinforced and made much more brutal through the three strikes laws, through the mandatory minimum sentences, which were up through his horrific uh, behavior around rushing back to Arkansas during his election to go and put uh, somebody who was mentally disabled to death. Right. He really set in place the the apparatus that we are still trying to dismantle today.